I recently switched from the, we used to lovingly call it the Britney Spears microphone, <laughs> the headset, uh, to this one, but I keep forgetting you have to actually pick it up. Um, how many of you, you know, a lot of times pastors start, preachers start, and they go, are you ready for the word today? And before you answer that question, I know a lot of you will go, yes. But, you know, I was just thinking my heart is so often for the people that don't feel ready for the word today. And sometimes I just think we don't say that enough, is that at the Abbey, we want to be a safe place, whether you feel ready for the word or whether you don't. Because there's a lot of times in our lives, we just get here is a victory. Paul and I work out six days a week. I was letting him supply that. He goes, you do. <laughs> he goes a lot of those days. And some days at the end of a workout, like I have a whole thing I go through all week long. And some days I walk out and I just tell myself, today the fact that I did it is the victory. So I don't rate myself on how well I did that day. I just think I did it. I did it all. And I just want to shout out to those of you who... If you're walking through stuff, if you're at home walking through stuff, you don't even have to feel ready for the Word because the Word's ready for you. And so we're going to dive right in, and, um, and we're going to continue our series, We Are the People We've Been Waiting For. And as you know, our, for two weeks now, our theme scripture has been from Isaiah chapter 33, verses 17 through 24. Um, this week, well, the first week, we talked about a people of beauty from verses 17 through 19. Last week, Paul delivered a people of purpose, which reminded us of our kingdom privilege and responsibility and authority. And this week, we're going to look at a people empowered, because it doesn't help to be know your purpose if you don't have a full revelation that you're empowered to live it. And he said that last week, but we're going to plunge deeper in that this week. And this week, our theme, our scripture is still Isaiah 33, but this is verses 21 and 22. And it says, but there, and it's still referring to Zion. And if you were here last two weeks, we really talked about what Zion is. But I put a little summary up there, uh, summarizing a lot of what we had said I like this wording. Zion symbolizes unobstructed spiritual consciousness. Now, does that sound too new agey for you? No, they stole it from Jesus. Jesus came to give you unobstructed spiritual consciousness. Matthew 6, and Luke eleven thirty four. 34. Jesus said, the eye of the lamp is the body, and if your eye is clear, your whole body is full of light. And I believe that's true for the body of Christ, too. If your eye is clear, your consciousness, your perceptions of God, what does that mean? It means that religion is swept away. In reality, the love of the Father is what you're living by and seeing. You don't see him as judgment. You see him as protection, and you see him as ultimate love. Okay, where, I'm still reading this Zion thing, where God's kingdom is now our home and dwelling, when you see that way, you see that he's now your dwelling on earth. We're not marching to Zion one day. We're living in Zion now. Zion was Jerusalem, God's people, God dwelling with his people in the old covenant physically, but now it's wherever we are. He dwells with us. So, but there in Zion, the Lord in majesty will be for us, and I love those two words, for us, a place of broad rivers and streams, where no galley with oars can go, nor majestic ships can pass. For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king. He will save us. That's our scripture for the day. And that little graphic there is just a little reminder. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Even Old Testament ones like this that are about ships and rivers and things that don't even sound modern all scriptures given by inspiration of God, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, that informs how we should read it and how we should preach it and how we should receive it. So think of this, speaking of rivers and streams, Jerusalem is one of the only major cities in the world, in the ancient world, that wasn't on a river. 
The Jordan River is 40 or more miles away. Jerusalem was not situated on a river. So it's never sustained. It's always been a water issue in the natural in Jerusalem. So what God's saying, he's saying every natural deficiency is more than made up for by me. I'm your river. I'm your irrigation. I'm your channel. I'm your spring. I'm your everything. What you lack in the natural. He even situated his city where it didn't have beauty and glory so much in the natural so that he could be its beauty and glory. And that's you and me. That's us. That's the church. So Jerusalem is this place of broad rivers. And I love that it says, for us. In other words, it's not, the world may look from, at Christianity from the outside and think, what's that all about? But it's a place of swimming in it for us. And from there, we invite them in. So speaking of rivers, here's that, that part of the, we'll start with that. But there the Lord in majesty will be for us, a place of broad rivers and streams. Notice it doesn't say he'll be like a river. It says he'll be our river. That means we can float, soak, swim in his goodness. It reminds us of Psalm 46, 4, and you've probably heard this scripture. There is a river whose streams delight the city of God, the holy place where the most high dwells. So you get the picture There's a river that splits up into streams and flows all over the city of God. We are the city of God. So this river from heaven, that's a picture of Revelation 21, the river of life that runs through heaven. And the Bible says there's 12 trees. I mean, this is freaky stuff, man. There's this river in heaven. It says there's 12 trees, but they call the 12 trees the tree of life. So one tree split into 12 somehow under the river. Come on, come on, engage your imagination, you know? Not just a tree of life, thank you very much, but there's this tree of life that's like 12 things on either side of the river, and it bears fruit every month, different fruit every month, and the Bible says that the fruit is the healing of the nations. And the word for healing is not the usual Greek word used for healing, it's the word therapeo, which is the root word of therapy. So I love to say that the word of God is whatever kind of therapy you need. The river of God grows whatever kind of therapy you need. Is it physical? Is it spiritual? Do you know there's spiritual therapy? Is it emotional? Anybody ever needed emotional therapy? Thank you. (laughs) I've needed that at times. There's all the kinds of therapy. The river is the source, but if you never investigate it and let it divide into streams that make your heart glad, you're not experiencing the therapy, are you? You're just looking at it from the outside in. So today there's a big invitation to the river. Many people see faith as a narrow passage or even a dry, dusty, dangerous climb. At times, those aspects can seem to be our experience. Has your faith life ever seemed like that at moments? Everybody's walked through that. But here, the Word of God offers us a very different spiritscape. It's not a hard, long climb up the mountain. It's a place of broad rivers. And it reminds us also of this scripture in Isaiah 61 that says, I will extend to her peace like a river. Can you just hear the voice of the Father saying, he's extending to you peace like a river today. Somebody needs that. Quit looking for peace as a dry packet of fix because it's coming to you like a river. It's in motion. It's not just an answer. It's a whole system of truth to dwell in. We might recognize the peace God gives if we look for it in the right way. It's not a fact, it's a flow. You don't wrap your head around it. You let it wash through your weary brain. So far, I'm having way much more fun than you, but I'm going to continue at the party inside my heart and head. I wore my tie-dye to ensure such a thing today. The Lord in majesty, Isaiah 31, 20. One, we just said it. 
the Lord in majesty will be for us a place of broad rivers and streams. And it goes on to describe the kind of river it is, and it says it this way, where no galley with oars can go, where no majestic ship can pass. Now, that does mean it's a, it's a city protected. Jerusalem was protected not by a natural river like a moat, like other cities, but by the river of God. So that means the offending enemy, right? None of these enemies can get you. But ever since 25 years ago when I read this scripture, it meant something completely different to me, and I believe it was by the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to share that with you today. I believe that the unique kind of, do you know the word hubris? Hubris is like pride in man, okay? I, the orphan spirit that we all have a touch of from the garden until we get healed. I have watched humanity. I'm a student of humanity. I love to study humanity. I like to do it from a distance, Enneagram 5, but I'm a student of humanity. I believe that that hubris can manifest in two different ways, and it's all still self-effort. One is here I have a picture of the galley with oars, what is that? That's totally human powered by sweat. I like to call it a rowboat, even though it's a giant rowboat. And so some people, when they feel abandoned, they just go, okay, fine. I don't need you. I'll do it myself. I'll just work harder. I'll work longer. I'm not afraid of the sweat of my brow. This gets lauded at the gym a lot, you know. Ugh, work it out. The other, however, decides, you know what? I don't like that sweating business. I'm just going to build a mighty ship and conquer it and delegate the sweating to other people. Right? Build it big, build it better, but it's still, can you, can you hear in that? It's the same root of, I'll do this. Self-effort. Which is because somebody's lied to us about our Father God and it's made it, they, religion has made us think he doesn't want to do it through us, that he's standing aloof, and we have to do it ourselves. Beware, I have to do it myself. And it'll come out one of two ways. It'll come out, fine, I'll just get on with it. Watch me work hard behind the scenes. Did, not all, it doesn't always get appreciated, does it? So then you get more like, well, nobody worked as hard as me. It, you can laugh. It's, it's really okay. We're funny. We're funny creatures. But then the other one is, and I'll just own up, uh, probably my husband would be more that. He would, he would just quietly, we, he helped our youngest son move this week, and he just went deep inside himself and was quietly churning out work. I, I, What? got done, and he's right to be somewhat proud of that. Yes, he is proud of that. I, on the other hand, I just always want to build a majestic ship. I just think, let's reinvent the strategy and build it bigger, better, delegate more. The, in, the, in the historical accounts of these ancient ships, which is what the Bible would have been talking about, uh, the galley with oars is totally human powered. And it said this, it said that they wanted it to be powered by human effort only because then it was independent of winds and currents. Now, isn't that interesting? Because what's the Holy Spirit but a wind or a current? And can you see that sometimes in your life you're just over here powering it away and the Holy Spirit's trying to blow and you're like, nope, going to keep... But the majestic ship, on the other hand, he's completely capitalizing. This, this thing is built for speed and nothing but speed. And it said that there's still rowing going on, but not by the commander. Um, and so it's completely built for speed. That's, this ship is called a trieme. And before a battle, they would lighten the load by leaving every unnecessary item on the shore. And isn't that like some people? In some people's, and please, if 
I don't know. I can't help it today. It may step on toes, but it's with love. I'm stepping on my own toes too. But some people build church like a majestic ship. They so want to be impressive. They so want to be the best thing happening, the best show happening. And what are they doing? They're lightening the load and they're leaving some important things on the shore because they think the battle they are in is for attention out in the marketplace, but they're leaving some things like health and rest and loving people and you understand but Jesus is saying to us today hey this river you don't need that self-effort or this self-effort this is a whole other river does this remind you I hope it I hope it reminds you of Zechariah 4 6 which is a famous refrigerator magnet scripture that says not I say that all the time and it doesn't always get a laugh it's mystery to me why it gets a laugh sometimes Thank you, Jonathan, for that laugh. Zechariah 4, 6 says, not by mind, not by power, but by my spirit. Guess what? The word power is actually a word meaning, no, it's the word might. I'll start with that one. The word might is actually a word meaning strength, efficiency, wealth, or an army. That's the mighty ship. Isn't that the majestic ship? It's saying not by that. But the word, the other word there, the word for power, it literally in the Hebrew means hardiness or endurance. And the root word is for a lizard. What is that? That's that can't get past my my skin's thick. Right? Right? The pride of I can endure anything. Listen, there's nothing wrong with both those characteristics, wanting to do it up nice and wanting to be enduring, unless you're doing them from an orphan spirit. So, self-effort comes in two forms. This is what I'm saying. The sweat of the brow, or I'll do this all by my hard work. Uh, that's the sweat of the brow. Or ambition to build it bigger and better and rise higher, watching others do the work. But both are rooted in the pride that comes from an orphan spirit. Whether you are the man or you work for the man, you're still on the hamster wheel in that case. If you're leaning only on self-effort and natural striving, which you are not born to do. But let's look at what you were born to do. Self-effort is the hamster wheel. Spirit effort is a whole other thing. And the next few slides have quotes from the Apostle Paul, who knew a little something about the conversion from self-effort to spirit effort. He was an expert at rowboats and mighty ships before he found Jesus. And this is what he says about spirit effort. First of all, Colossians 1.29 This is the NIV. He says, To this end I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. Other translations. Let's bring this out further. Because can you see the cooperation? He's not saying I sat around and waited for the power to lift me out of my chair and make me do something. He's saying I worked hard, but not in my own strength. Weymouth says, To this end, like the earnest wrestler... I exert all my strength in reliance upon the power of him who's mightily at work in me. What a mystery that is. You can't do that without being in union with Christ. But in union with Christ, that's how it works. The Amplified Classic, because we Amplified Bible possessors are old enough now to be classic, and then there's a new one. So this is like classic rock, classic Amplified. For this I labor unto weariness. Oh, that's interesting. I still feel weariness. But it says, striving with all the superhuman energy which he so mightily enkindles and works within me. Can you hear the partnership, the union? Again, you can't do this with just God in heaven and me down here. This is an indwelling reality of the Christian life. The Passion Translation says, It has become my inspiration and passion in ministry to labor with a tireless intensity with his power flowing through me. Personally, I think Paul was an Enneagram 3 who learned 
how not to deal. He learned how to tap into a power to release him to be strong in every area instead of self-effort. But wait, there's more from the Apostle Paul. 1 Corinthians 15.10, but by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Does that sound like self-effort? No, I don't believe so. I believe it's the response to the empowering God within. He's saying, I worked harder than everybody because I have a different power empowering me. He also wrote, oh, Weymouth says, But what I am, I am by the grace of God, and his grace bestowed upon me did not prove ineffectual but I labored more strenuously than all the rest. Yet it was not I, but God's grace working in me. He also wrote in Ephesians 3.20, Now to him who's able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, you know this scripture, according to how hard I rode, no, according to how mighty I built the ship, how glitzy my fog machine dazzled in the air while worship happened. Again, nothing wrong with fog machines. I'm just trying to make a point about human nature. It's not according to either of those things. It's according to the power that is at work in us. The Passion Translation says, Never doubt God's mighty power to work in you and accomplish all this. All what? For you and me, it's all he's wanting to do through us. Build his church. He will achieve infinitely more than your greatest request, your most unbelievable dream, and exceed your wildest imagination. He will outdo them all for his miraculous power constantly energizes you. Doesn't that sound like a place of broad rivers and streams and you don't need your rowboat, and you don't even need to build a mighty ship. You just need to swim in him. One more slide of the Apostle Paul's quotes, because he really saw this. Apostle Paul had a revelation of spirit effort that is available to all of us. Philippians 2.13, For it is God who is working in you, enabling you both, to desire, and to work out his good purpose. The Amplified Classic says, Not in your own strength, for it is God who is all the while effectually at work in you, energizing and creating in you the power and the desire. That scripture changed my life. Um, When I was at ORU, when Paul and I were at ORU, we, we were required to go to church every Sunday. They had dorm check. They couldn't check. Well, if you went to church at a service that wasn't Sunday morning, you had to bring back a bulletin to prove you really went once a weekend, like if you went to a Saturday night service. But on the Sunday morning, they just checked to see if you were out. So some what was that grocery store? Some people went to, there was a grocery store that had a precursor of an early Starbucks And uh, near finals week, you would find a bunch of ORU students in there studying because they had to get out of their dorm. They didn't go to church. They were studying. And that's funny. The what? The Village Inn. Anybody know Village Inn? They don't have them. Thank you. Yes. It's like Denny's or something. Anyway, but we, um, we all had to go to church. We had to get out of our dorm. And uh, so we, we went faithfully to church, except for right before finals week. Um, and um, I can remember that I'd go to church, and I would get in there. And if you don't know, Paul and I were uh, chemistry majors, biology minors. And so a lot of times I'd get to church, and my head was still running reactions and memorizing structures of amino acids and things like that. So they would start singing, um, and I mean, I'm a, in love with Jesus, spirit-filled Christian, but it was my head going other places. So I don't know if you've ever had this experience. I'm sure many of you have. Maybe it wasn't amino acids in your head, but something in your head. And they're singing the songs, and people around you are all going, I'm in love with Jesus. And I'm going, 
Okay, Jesus made amino acids. Wait, no, okay. <laughs> and you know what? The Holy Ghost, and this was the beginning of a series of a bunch of these. Because of that scripture, I meditated a lot on that scripture in my early days in the Amplified Classic. And, um, and I, the Holy Ghost would say to me, Hey, Perry Ann, let me create in you the power and the desire. So you know what I started doing? I would immediately, rather than wrestle with my head and go, Why am I not more spiritual? Rather than compare myself to the flowy people next to me, what I did is I just went, hey, Christ in me wants to worship. Boom. It was a, the portal opened every time. Because I, I, I had really meditated to the point it was real in me. Christ in me is right now energizing in me the desire to worship. And then I stepped into his desire to worship his father and skip the self-effort of trying to beat myself up for not being there. And then later in life, that extended to other issues like loving people. <laughs> Which is why I say this all the time, because it's such a never, you don't pray for patience, not because, you know that old thing everybody goes, don't no, pray for patience, God will give you. Pa patience is a fruit of the Spirit. He's not beating you up for not having it. He's actually, he's imparted it to you. And the situation calls for you to go, not in my own strength, but Christ in me is patient. You activate what's downloaded into you rather than, I don't know, maybe some of y'all don't wrestle with yourself as much as I used to, but I did. And I was happy when God set me free from that. Uh, not in your own strength. God is effectually working you energizing. He will even energize that desire in you. My God, I don't feel like I want to love people today. He will energize that desire in you. It's more than a feeling. Boston. Um, energizing and creating in you the power and desire, both to will and to work for his good pleasure and satisfaction and delight. Does he want you to do it? Then he will energize in you the desire to do it. The Passion Translation says, God will continually revitalize you. Anybody need revitalizing? Implanting within you the passion to do what pleases him. What a great life. This is not hardship. That's why he said, my yoke is easy and my burden's light. Paul, the man who was once the pioneer of self-effort in both forms, rowboat, mighty ship, clearly shows himself to have a whole new value system, one that is grounded in grace. The greatest secret in the Christian life just may be how absolutely empowering grace actually is. It sounds passive or limiting to unspiritual ears. Like if we just say, well, by the grace of God. That's not grace. That's actually mercy. And even then, mercy is stronger than that. Grace is empowering. When you get to know God and his huge revolutionary gift to mankind through the cross, you begin to realize he's made you a heaven-powered dynamo, whether you feel it or not. He has put within you an implant of kingdom purpose and the energy to perform it. Unless you think that might be limited to a pulpit and preaching, it's not. God wants you to excel in your space of life. We fear giving up our ways to his ways because we don't factor in how much he wants to partner with us. Still, the Genesis mandate, fill the earth and subdue it. Are you in education? He wants you to fill the earth and subdue it. Are you in business? He wants to help you, partner with you, energize you to fill the earth and subdue it. Not just by making converts, that too, but first by doing excellently as he partners with you. The acorn in the picture bears the mighty oak inside it. God's seed of empowering grace is in you. What might grow from that? The seed is God's favorite metaphor. Everything he does starts as a seed and is more powerful than anything. So this is grace. 
God freely reproducing the actions, that means the actions of Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ in everyone. He's already accomplished it, but by grace, you believe, and it is piped into you in full measure. Death to your old man, resurrection to your new. This also is grace. He's actively empowering you to be distinctively you and take over your little portion of the world with his kingdom glory. But you can't do that with self-effort. Now, the second part of that verse, Isaiah 33, 22, uh, of our passage for today, it said right after that about broad rivers and streams, it says, the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. Now, I think, and we're going to spend a minute talking about this. When we hear lawgiver, many of us still think Mount Sinai rather than Mount Zion. So in Hebrews 8, verses 18 through 24, the writer of Hebrews, whether it was Paul or somebody else, is writing to Jewish people and convincing them that the new covenant was God's plan all along. But he's got to get their eyes off the old covenant because they're pretty in touch with the scary God. Mount Zion, Hebrews 8, tells us that there was trembling and fire and scary stuff and smoke. I'll just read it to you real quick. It says, you have not come. This is Hebrews 12, 18 through 24. You have not come to a mountain that may be touched, a blazing fire. In other words, not a physical mountain. A blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet, and a voice whose words made the hearers beg no more. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. That's the old covenant God. That's Mount Sinai, where the law was given. The commandments were given. So when we hear law giver, Some of us think of that, and the Jews definitely thought of that. But the writer of Hebrews saying, no, 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 no. This new covenant has come. And it says, verse 22, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, innumerable angels in festal gathering. And the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. That's the elimination of fear. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. We don't usually think of lawgiver as salvation. We think of it as punishment. But the new covenant, the lawgiver, is now salvation. We've come to Mount Zion. So there's a new law given to us that does not invoke the fear motif. Here's a graphic somebody made, which is kind of too small to read. But the point is, on the left it says, You have not come to this mountain, Mount Sinai, the earthly mountain, the old covenant, the unapproachable awesome God, but you have come to this mountain, Mount Zion. That's us, y'all, the new covenant. We've come to Mount Zion. This was the goal of Sinai all along. The heavenly Jerusalem, the new covenant, the awesome God approachable through the blood of Jesus Christ. You've come to grace, to be loved and welcomed and empowered as a son or daughter of God, for kingdom business. But we all forget at times, and we only remember the condemnation and fear. Do we not? Are you you getting this? Sometimes we still act like we've come to Mount Sinai, right? Sometimes we still approach God with the memory of our past or our sin or our shortcoming, rather than realizing we can run to this welcoming God, because that's what the new covenant's about. So, In simplest terms, the messaging is this. Mount Sinai, stay back. Mount Zion, come up, come in. All that difference because of the blood of Jesus. So you can let let your conscience be cleansed 
from dead works, what does that mean? That I have to stay back. The lawgiver now is a whole different thing. The lawgiver, how about this? Romans 8, 2. For in Christ Jesus, the law, the spirit of life, set you free from the law of sin and death. How about that as a lawgiver? How about the law of the spirit of life, which the law of the universe, the law of grace that superseded all the performance of the old covenant? We don't need to fear the lawgiver. It's a living law imparted to the deepest heart to free you. Here's the Amplified. I don't know if it's classic or not. For the law of the spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus, I love this phrase, the law of our new being, which has set you free from the law of sin and death. Sinai, no, Zion. We have come to Zion. God's word translation says, the standards of the spirit who give life through Christ Jesus have set you free from the standards of sin and death. The new covenant, Hebrews 10, 16, Jeremiah 31, 33, there's bunches of scriptures that talk about the way God did this is he wrote his law in your heart. So he made it your desire. He doesn't want automatons in fear. He doesn't want people in cringing fear, afraid they'll miss it. He wants people living out of the implant of his spirit within them. One of my favorite scriptures early on is this, Psalm 119, 165. Who here in this room will admit that they love Psalm 119? Thank you. You might be a teacher motivation like me. Um, It's so long. But see, I never read it as a thing to perform because God put this foundational thing in me. So the whole Bible I communed with as what was already in my heart that I got to live out. Instead of, oh, i got to measure up to this. So Psalm 119, even the Old Testament. So verse 165, I love this scripture. It says, and I'm going to tell you why I loved it and what the Holy Spirit unpacked in me early on. Great peace have those who love your law. Nothing can make them stumble. And way back in the day, I looked up the word stumble, and it's kashal, and it's a stumbling block or an enticement. I looked it up in the old paper Strong's Concordance, if anyone remembers that, with the pages that get all wadded up and all of that. Enticement, obstacle, offense, or, wait for it, scruple. Now, that was an intriguing word. I'd heard it, of course. Doesn't it sound Victorian? You know the phrase, have you no scruples? You ever heard that phrase? A scruple... Here's a definition. A scruple is a mental or moral reservation causing doubt, misgivings, or hesitancy and inhibiting action. A synonym is a qualm, an uneasy feeling of doubt, worry, or fear, especially about one's own conduct. So that may not sound like much until you go to try to believe God to heal you and thoughts come like, well, have you prayed enough? Do you even read your Bible? What about that person you were mean to yesterday? Those are scruples. You understand? Are those things important? Yes, but you're living out the life of God in you. You're not earning the right to be healed. Great peace have they that love your law. The proper relationship with law is falling in love with it. And I mean the law of the spirit of life, the law of your new being. Fall in love with it. And then even if you goof up, God, look what I did. It was never about me anyway. Thank you that healing's not dependent on my behavior. Have you no scruples? I have no scruples. This is a lot more fun than some of you are letting it be, y'all. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, because here's the deal. Look, Look right here. There's a... This is a mental health reality, and I did not even actually know it, but I might have had a touch of it. People with, it's called scrupulosity, so it's it's a thing in psychology. People with scrupulosity have persistent, irrational, unwanted beliefs and thoughts about being devout, about not being devout or moral enough, despite evidence to the contrary. Now, the only evidence the contrary that's worth anything is the blood of Jesus. They believe that they will sin 
disappoint God, or be punished for failing. They blame themselves for falling short of impossibly high standards. They are tortured by the intensity of their doubts about their goodness and the belief that they are therefore downright bad. Can I just tell you, I think everybody that grew up in the Bible Belt has a touch of this. We all have some scruples. And can I just tell you, they're not God. He does not give you scruples. He heals them. And people think he gives them. Now, there are some people that are out there just flagrantly not giving a rip. But even then, he doesn't want to put a, something on the outside of them. He wants to come in union with them and birth righteousness in them. So this helps me a lot deal with people who are rebellious because I realize they just haven't been reached yet with the righteousness of God. I would much rather have honesty from them than outward compliance that's not real. Uh, Romans 8, 15 in the Message Bible says, This resurrection life you receive from God is not a timid, grave-tending life. It's adventurously expectant, greeting God with a childlike, what's next, Papa. That's a life with no scruples. It's not a life with no moral values, but it's a life with no scruples. What if, what if, what if? I know this won't relate to all of you, but I've been very open about this all my ministry life, and I will keep being that way. I used to pray, if I prayed a prayer of repentance for anything, I'd, I'd, I'd just stop and I'd check inside to make sure I meant it. Has anyone else ever done that? It, it's very freeing to admit that you're doing that. Like, wait, because you know your mind wanders? Uh, sometimes when my favorite song comes on the gym, I have to start it over because my mind wandered. And I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. You know, my mind's always going. So I'd go to pray a prayer of repentance and I'd think, wait, I don't know if I felt that. Y'all got, that's a scruple. If your heart was pure and going there, you don't have to drill down into this analysis paralysis of motives. Just be real with him and dance with him. And by that, you get to a place like this where you can honestly say, this is another quote from Psalm 119, how sweet are your words to my taste. Yes, sweeter than honey to my mouth. From your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. You don't need scruples. You just need to love him. And then you start going, ooh, I don't want that. All right, so... I'm going to circle back to the closing thoughts about Zion and Law, and I'm going to point out two more scriptures, and then I'm going to make the most unusual closing that you'll ever hear in your life. Isaiah 2, verses 2 and 3, many people will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. This is new covenant stuff, y'all. This is what we should be living in now. To the temple of the God of Jacob, he will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his path. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Micah Micah 4 verses 1 through 3 echoes the same thing. It shall come to pass in the latter days. The mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of mountains. We're living in that day now. And it shall be lifted up among the hills. And people shall flow to it. And many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God, that he may teach us his ways, and that may we, we may walk in his path. That's the lawgiver, giving the law of the spirit of life. For out of Zion shall go forth the law. Not the demands of the law, but the imparted spirit of the law. The beauty of loving the law. I love this quote. I would love to live like a river flows, carried by the surprise of its own unfolding. That's how God wants you to live in relationship to him as your lawgiver, your king, your judge, your salvific Lord. He wants to save you, and he wants his revelation always unfolding in you. And the great news, as I've said all morning, is it's already in you. It's just unfolding outwardly. So, I was thinking about this, words like a river, and if you're me, and listen, you know, God uses everything from your, bat, your past. God wants to redeem your past and your passions, and so if you're me, 
and you think of words flowing out like a river, you immediately, it's very normal for me, you think of John Lennon and Across the Universe because this is what it says. Words are flowing out like endless rain into a paper cup. They slither wildly as they slip away across the universe. That sounds more like the God I know. That's been my experience of him. Words from heaven are flowing out like endless rain into my little paper cup. And they're wildly flying around through the cosmos and then imparting to me the reality of the stars and the moon and the sun and the what? Drifting, oh wait, pools of sorrow, waves of joy are drifting through my open mind, possessing and caressing me. John Lennon wrote about the God I know and he didn't even know what he was writing about. Listen to this one. Images of broken light which dance before me like a million eyes, they call me on and on across the universe. Thoughts meander like a restless wind inside a letterbox. They tumble blindly as they make their way across the universe. Sounds of laughter, shades of life <laughs> are ringing through my open ears, inciting and inviting me. Limitless, undying love which shines around me like a million suns. It calls me on and on across the universe. That's, that's only been fulfilled in my life by the Lord Jesus Christ, introducing me to the creator God. And yet, guess what? John Lennon wrote that song. He was married to his first wife, Cynthia, and they were fighting. They were having what the Brits call a row which is a kinder, gentler word for a fight. Paul and I don't fight. We have rows. <laughs> Sounds so much better in British. So they were having a row, and she was like, they were laying in bed, and she was just, he, he, in his words, going on and on. And so he got up, and he walked downstairs, and he just, the thought in his head was, words are flowing out, except he thought it with a British accent. And... He sat down at the keyboard, and he started with words are flowing out. <laughs> and he said all of a sudden he realized he was not writing about Cynthia anymore. He said all of a sudden this negative annoyance morphed into this hymn that flowed from him. And he even said about those lyrics, he said, I knew I didn't own it. It just came through me. That's his exact quote. And I sang those, those words as a teenager and wondered what they meant. And later as an adult, I thought, limitless, undying love that shines around me like a million suns, only God. But my heart bleeds for the Christians who are going, I wouldn't listen to the Beatles. <laughs> well, John Lennon was looking for limitless, undying love to shine around him like a million suns. And I'm like, oh my God. We got it. <laughs> Took me a while to get past religion to even see I got it. Okay, but if there are purists in our audience who burned their rock and roll albums back in the day, I know what you're thinking. I did too, and then I bought them back digitally. <laughs> I did. I really did. I did it in my backyard in the city limits, illegal to set a fire, so I broke them with my knee, and the stack was high. It's a little painful, but I think I need to do it in that moment. <laughs> Thankfully, they're all on download now. But, Yay. but, and I don't just listen to anything. Talk to me later. <laughs> nope, don't talk to me later. <laughs> Those of you who are not sure are thinking right now, do you need my glasses for this? You're thinking, but Perry Ann, that song has some Hindu words of, of Sanskrit in it. Because I skipped reading the line... Does anybody know the song? Know where I'm going? I skipped reading the line that says, Jai Guru Deva Om. And there was a time in my life that I would mute that part when it came on. <laughs> but let me tell you something. Do you know what it means? The meaning of Jai Guru Deva 
in the literal Sanskrit is glory to the shining remover of darkness. Hmm. It's a universal, the phrase is a universal salutation, blessing, greeting, opening and closing used by meditators for millennia. But this teacher, this Eastern teacher said, who, it's, who Guru Deva is to the individual user of the phrase is beside the point. In other words, even they are saying, eh, whoever removes your darkness, just sing to them. I want to tell you there's only one shining remover of darkness. And you and I know him. <laughs> Jai Guru Deva. What? We know him. And get this. This again, I'm reading you an Eastern religion thing. Can you believe it on a Sunday morning? I can't believe it. I have a scruple, little bitty scruple left, but I'm doing it. <laughs> Jai Guru Deva is a way of reminding oneself regularly and acknowledging with others the truth that everything we enjoy some, so freely came from a source other than one small self, and it is an offer of gratitude to that source. He's a place of broad rivers. Thank you. But wait, there's one more thing that covered Jai Guru Deva, but it said Om. So, in the event, in the, uh, an effort to be completely comprehensive here. Om is a mantra consisting, it's actually a blend of sounds, and it's to be used in the contemplation of ultimate reality. Well, I know him too. And it's supposed to be the sound that connects to the universe, that connects the self to the universe, <laughs> which if you're as deep in the knowledge of classic rock as I am, there's a little moody blues thing. Anybody? A few people are nodding. I'll read it to you because I'm in so deep, I don't care. I'm drowning in no scruples. This is from the, this is from the um, album In Search of the Lost Chord in 1968, which can I tell you who's the lost chord? Jesus. We have him. They wrote this, this garden universe vibrates complete. Some may get a sound so sweet. Vibrations reach on up to become light and then through gamma out of sight. I don't know if drugs were involved, but still truth underlies. Between the eyes and ears there lie the sounds of color and the light of a sigh. And to hear the sun, what a thing to believe. But it's all around if we could but perceive. To know ultraviolet for red and x-rays. <laughs> Beauty to find in so many ways. Two notes of the chord, that's our full scope. But to reach the chord is our life's hope. I'm sitting before a room of people who have reached the chord. And to name the chord is important to some, so they give it a word. <laughs> and the word is... <laughs> and I found this graphic this week. Worship team, you can come. Some form of a worship team can come. Daniel, bring a party. It's a party, Daniel. <sighs> I found this graphic this week. So OM, you've seen it spelled O-M, but as I said to you, it's a blend, and it's supposed to be A-U-M. And somebody did the OM symbol, and then they made this arrow to the word Amen. OM is supposed to be the universal sound, but do you know the word Amen transcends all the languages? The word Amen, which means truth, OM is the, supposed to be questing for the universe, Amen is a biblical word for truth. You know, when Jesus said, verily, verily, I say unto you, in the Aramaic, he was saying, amen, amen, I say unto you. And he ended every prayer with amen. And it, like, you can go travel around the world in various dozens of languages. They end their prayers with amen. But guess what? He is the amen. 1 Corinthians 1.20 says... 
that no matter how many the promises God has made, they are all yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. And in Revelation 3.14, it says, These things say, says the amen, capital A, it's Jesus. The faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Now, see that CCC 1065? I did not immediately know what CCC 1065 was, but guess what? You can Google any doggone thing. So to the Google search box, I typed in CCC 1065, and it is the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And in line 1065, it says, Jesus Christ himself is the amen. He is the definitive amen of the Father's love for us. He takes up and completes our amen to the Father. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why we utter the amen through him to the glory of God. Is there a sacred sound of the universe? It's anything that comes out of his mouth. But there's a law. There are laws. There are spiritual laws and truths in the universe. It's not haphazard. It's vibrating with beauty and a spiritual kind of physics that manifests in natural physics. Does it sound like, um... Oh, it sounds like the Word of God. Jesus is the Logos, the living Word of God. One of those uh, spiritual teachers, he said, um, he said, and honestly, I'm not making fun because I believe they're on a quest. It's just that we found the end of the quest. He said, if you get quiet enough, this is an Eastern guy, I'm not saying he was a Christian. He said, if you get quiet enough, you can hear the vibration of the universe. And he said, you can hear God humming. I want to tell you, you can hear more than the hum. God's word that he spoke when he spoke these worlds into existence is still vibrating with the power that he released when he made them. And if you get quiet enough, you can hear that and line up with it. But here's the best news of all. It's already in you. So you're lining yourself up with what he's imparted in you. <sighs> Can you see that there's a whole different way to relate to scripture than we've been taught over the years? It's not words to measure up to. It's words to release the reality of love the reality of the right kind of life, the reality of righteousness, and the reality of living up to your full potential. Because you won't do that without those character qualities that matter. If you know Enneagram, I've been hard on threes today. But you know we all are human. We're all in this boat together. We all fall back in self-effort when we forget that God is a good, good father. We all fall back in the orphan spirit and try to provide for ourselves, And it's so sad because we don't have to. So at the end of the day, I think I know what Daniel's playing and I think we just need to have a party. I don't even, I don't even want to lead a prayer of repentance right now today. I think we just need to tune in to what's already inside us. Now, if you don't have Jesus in your heart or you are standing super far back, come back, come home, take care of that. That's easy. But could we all as a group just close out with a time? Why don't you stand up? And could we just zoom out and celebrate 
who this God is. Limitless, undying love that shines upon you like a million suns. Today, he's calling you on and on across the universe, out of your problems, out of your limitations, into a download of heaven that will change every problem in your life. Thank you. Take it away, worship team. joining the Abbey service today. We are so thankful for you, and we pray that this message blessed you this week. Don't stop here. Stay connected with us by liking us on Facebook, 
and subscribing to our YouTube channel. Please see below for additional ways to receive updates and news, as well as stay engaged with our Abbey community. You can also support the Abbey through giving on any of our platforms. We are grateful for your continued giving to help us reach people around the world and grow the kingdom through local and international missions. Thank you again for watching. We love you and God bless.